an institution of American fine dining, the Blackberry Farm sits a lengthy drive outside of Knoxville in Tennessee. The restaurant defines fine dining and utilizes its self-proclaimed farm to create one of the most unique restaurant experiences in the U.S. Despite no Michelin stars, it is a Relais Chateau, one of the highest designations that can be given to a hotel-restaurant combo, similar to what we saw at the Inn at Little Washington, and today we're cracking into their wine list at a whopping 273 pages. So we have farm to table fine dining at this hidden luxury mountain resort and now we need to decide what we are going to drink with the meal. And here's how we'll approach the list. Firstly, we'll assume no sommelier is available to help us. They're out on the farm. The goats got out. Then we'll assume that the wine list and menu online are completely up to date. There is a tasting menu available, but not published on their site, so we'll use a la carte. And then we'll approach in the following financial circumstances. Firstly, we'll order by the glass only, control our intake and spend. Then one bottle under $150 as we're on a Tinder date with someone who wants to try something old. We'll approach with $500 and $5,000 budgets. And lastly, with an infinite amount of money. Let's start with wines by the glass. And it appears that the bubbles are at the bottom of the list for some reason, but regardless, we'll make our selection. Dinner features some cheese, pig ears, asparagus in the front of the menu, so I'm thinking something a little bit more rustic. The Oil de Pedri by Jean Valsal. This means eye of the partridge, so a lightly pink style of rosé coming from a grower producer. Again, a family-owned operation making high-quality bubbles here at $33 is darn hard to beat. And for white wine, I'm feeling a little sancerre. That potato and spring onion soup would go wonderfully with this northern French Sauvignon Blanc coming from Domaine Revedry, one of the most highly regarded names in all of Sancerre. I'm expecting a crisp minerality with a touch of a green herbaceousness that will play really nice with almost any middle of the menu. Now we'll certainly be discussing the Melville selections later on, but for now let's look at Domaine de Bosquet coming from Gigandos, their reserve 2018. Grenache dominant blend, rustic, rich, and decadent. When I see the Wagyu flank steak, even the duck breast or the Fields Farm lamb on the menu, I think all of those are going to be wonderful with some old world rustic, leathery, sort of funky style of wine I'd expect here with Domaine de Bosquet. 23 bucks for Rhone Valley is again a killer price point for buy the glass and it doesn't look like the program has a big focus on dessert wine otherwise we'd finish up with some sweetness but maybe we'll enjoy one of these de-alcoholized Chardonnays. A little French heavy for buy the glass but you know me we're in and out and under a hundred dollars for three really high quality glasses of wine all somewhat cognizant of the menu service we can expect here at the Blackberry Farm. And our Tinder dates looking for something with some bottle age and here on the wine list there's a emphasis on Melville's wines a huge vertical here from their Santa Rita Hills operation specifically the estate bottled Pinot Noir 2001. Founded in 1989 by Ron Melville, now being taken over by his son Chad Melville, this is really a classic expression of California Pinot Noir in the Santa Rita Hills, an area that doesn't really get a lot of love at the fine dining level, and here we see an unbeatable value of 20 plus year old Pinot that should be drinking quite nicely, and it's under $100. There's an emphasis on the winery here at Blackberry Farm, presumably because of their focus on sustainability, as well as the really farm to glass style that Melville carries. I expect this to be drinking pretty nicely. I've drank a few older expressions of Santa Rita and I'd be really interested in exploring Melville's. It's not quite 19th century Bordeaux, but a 20 year old Pinot, that's good enough for any Tinder date in my book, especially at under $100. Now let's take a look at the list with a $500 budget. Now I certainly love champagne, especially grower producers, and starting the meal with bubbles is my absolute favorite, but check this out. 1996 Gala Sparkling Shiraz. And really I think we're looking at a wine actually from Tasmania, not South Australia. This is an incredible family owned business. It's considered the second oldest operation in all of Tasmania, coming up on its sixth generation of family owned wine 
winemaking. Does this age well? Is this the right winery? Who knows? I can't wait to drink this. This is honestly one of the coolest wines I've ever seen on a wine list. There are so few wines that exist in the world in this style, and much less to be in a program like this, absolutely no hesitation. Let's pull this cork. Oh, thank goodness we're back in France. We're in the Rhone Valley and I'm feeling like drinking a little Condrieu. It doesn't get enough love here and I think Francois Villard's going to be a darn good time. Let's go with his 2001 Terrazes du Palais. Francois is a chef turned winemaker with a very small start having gone certified organic just recently in 2022. This wine's going to be 100% Viognier. I absolutely adore it with a touch of bottle age. This really seems to be one of his signature productions utilizing just a touch of new oak. So I'm expecting something with some roundness, some texture, some weight on the palate. It should play beautifully with a lot of those middle menu options we saw. I think this is going to be absolutely killer. Now we're running a trend of bottle age and I don't normally drink this much California, but it's a signature and classic American restaurant and they've got some really interesting stuff. For red, let's go with the Tablas Creek Vineyard 1999 Reserve Cuvée. Now Psalms around the world will turn their nose up at Paso Robles given the opportunity unless you mention Tablas Creek. This is a joint operation between the Haas family of vineyard brands and the Perrin family of Chateau de Bocastel, which we've discussed on the channel before. The vines at the estate were cuttings from Bocastel in Chateauneuf du Pop, and this is going to be a Rhone style blend. Now they don't produce this this specific wine anymore, but 99 is a great California vintage. In this, a sort of Rhone style of wine is going to be rich and decadent with some incredible complexity thanks to wonderful winemaking. An excellent way to cap off the meal with wonderful bottle age and a super approachable price. Massively under budget, over 20 years of bottle age on each of these selections. This is a cool wine list and this is going to be a really fun dinner. Now let's see what we can do with just a touch more money and crank the budget to $5,000. All right, no more silly bubbles. This time we're going grower and we're going with Jacques Asson's 2012 Terre Rouge. Now, mainly I'm just excited to talk about Jacques Asson because we have not seen a lot of it on the channel and this looks actually to be a little bit better than the price we've seen on some other lists. Now, the house is founded in 1798. One of its partners goes on to found a house called Krug, which has a little bit of fame in Champagne, if you've ever heard of it. Now, this is the Terre Rouge, which means it's going to be 100% Pinot Noir and Rosé. 12, a killer vintage for Champagne, one of the most celebrated of the past two decades. Definitely young could obviously go much, much longer, but I'm not going to complain. I think I'm going to enjoy this quite a lot, and this is a fantastic way to start the meal. Now, it's not a real episode of Troy's Tasting Room unless we're looking at nearly 100-year-old bottles of wine, and I see CVNE's 1939 Special Reserve. So, Rioja Blanco, this is going to be 100% Viera, aged in oak barrels. Is the 39 going to be drinking nicely? I've drank some old, old Rioja, but I'm talking 50s, 60s, but I'm willing to give it a shot. It's going to be oxidative, and it's going to be pretty one of a kind. These are wines that are definitely designed to age. I've seen wines of this age on the market before, and honestly, I think this would be the place to take the gamble and see how it's showing. Now, I promised you Burgundy, and I'm here to deliver. Let's go with the 2005 Claude Dugat Cham Chambatin Grand Cru. We don't drink enough Chambatin on the channel, and I'm here to rectify that. I love 05 as a vintage, and Claude Dugat, really one of the signature producers of Chambatin as a whole, working with almost all of the sub vineyards here. I like Shams for its sort of ethereal elegance, and especially with bottle age, it starts to pick up a lot of earth, and Dugat, really a classic producer here. Family owned and operated, small production, and their signature Grand Cru, what's not to love? We skated by on budget. We've got some insane bottle age, a uh, classic, and, well, something signature to Burgundy. Now let's go ahead and spend, well, all of the money we possibly can. 
There's some fancy Krug and Bollinger on the list here, but I just always go for Solos when I see the opportunity to do it. The Grand Cru from Moïse I, the Blanc de Noise. Now I believe this is coming from a single vineyard site called Sous Le Mont, which is 100% Pinot Noir, first vintage 2005. I don't know why it's not labeled the same as the other Grand Cru's, there's some inconsistency in how they're printed on the list here. Could just be their list management system, could just be being a butthead. So we've talked about Solos on the channel before for, but this is the premier grower producer, the one who's really defined the style of both single vineyard champagne moving into the market at a non-prestige level, as well as the identity of the grower producer. Many consider themselves to be disciples of Solos, and now since 2018, his son Guillaume running the estate. And finally, it's time to dive into some Burgundy. It's not often I see Domaine d'Auvenay, and let's go for their 1999 Le Folletier en la Richard. Davenay is owned by the same family as Domaine Loire. So this is La Lubie's Loire, whose husband passed away recently, leaving the estate in her management. Only four hectares of vines, which is a very small amount of wine to be coming out of the estate. This is one of those gods and goddesses of production. They also make a Chevalier Montmachet Grand Cru, which they have on the list here as a 2011, but I don't like the 11 vintage, and I don't think I can justify $12,000 on that bottle when my single favorite Premier Cru and pretty much all of White Burgundy is available here, on Le Richard referring to a much smaller subsection within the vineyard of a higher quality. This is a once in a lifetime bottle here and Blackberry Farm has probably the largest collection of Domaine d'Avenay I have ever seen in my career. I have only ever opened a single bottle of d'Avenay, the Mosey Chambatin, and I have not seen it again since, so this is really something special to Blackberry Farm. Speaking of Domaine Loire, let's go ahead and enjoy a little red from them. I see their Richborg 2002, and honestly, this is again one of those labels I just don't see very often. We've ordered Loire on the channel, I believe it was in 1949 at the French Laundry, but that was one of the only labels they had. There's a vertical of Richborg here, two labels, but again, that's still incredibly impressive and really just a testament to how special the wine list has been here at Blackberry Farm. Domaine Loire, again, one of the gods of production here in Burgundy, incredibly rare and small. Richborg, really one of my favorite of the Red Grand Cru's. I think it tends to produce the biggest, the boldest, the densest and richest style of Pinot. Some may prefer the more Romani Conti style of sort of ethereal Burgundy or even Latache for power and intensity, but Luan really is their signature here in Richborg. And at $10,000, you know what? We got to get one big bottle out of the final section. Now we've spent more on a single bottle than we did in the entire wine list of Blackberry Farm, but I must say it's been an incredible list. Its size, scope, and scale is absolutely incredible. It's been unmatched with some of the others we've seen so far. Didn't quite have the verticals that we saw at Burns and the depth of vintages. Didn't quite have the eclectic nature of wines like Cote and Momofuku, but really the Burgundy, the Alsace, Champagne list are all absolutely extraordinary. So thank you so much for watching and joining me here in Troy's tasting room. Join us again when we are back with another wine list and as we continue to explore new topics. Thank you.